A very happy Sabbath, Belston Adventist family and friends. I am so glad to welcome you to our worship today. I would also like to extend my greetings to those who may not be members of our local church here on the platform, and those who may be watching now online, and those who will watch at a later time via our YouTube channel. You know, Sabbath day is a happy day because this is a special time, a memorial of creation when God in his wisdom created our planet and everything in it. The more we keep the Sabbath faithfully, the more we remember where we came from and who created us. This is the day when we can completely cast all our cares to him, forget all the mundane things, the work, the job, the business, the physical labor that we do during the week, and catch up with our spiritual aspect. Making use of this quality time to be with our families, to fellowship with each other, and to give glory to God in our worship because he deserves it. And so, the blessings that we will receive today is largely dependent on how wide we open our minds and hearts to receive his word. Now please, let us mute our mics and sing as loud as we can as the communication team leads us in the opening hymn. Upon those who 
It is now time to bring ourselves before the throne of grace. Please assume a position of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another Sabbath. The whole world is experiencing challenging times, but we still are grateful for all that you are to us. Because it's through these times that you make your presence felt even closer. Thank you for your love and forgiveness each day. We are all blessed because of you. Today, Father, I want to pray for our brothers and sisters who face struggles of all kinds. Some are faithful servants of yours, doing your hard work in hard places. Some are grieving, some are making hard decisions, others are struggling with addictions, and others are in their spiritual battles. Please give them the strength to get through whatever they are facing and help them to surrender totally to your will. Heavenly Father, we lift up all those who are facing various illnesses. Give them the hope and the courage they need today and every day. Ease their pain, calm their fears, and surround them with your peace. Please give us a compassionate heart to be able to forgive and to show mercy to those who have hurt and wronged us. Help us, Lord, to look after each other in a loving way that we may be able to show others what it is like to have Jesus in our lives. We pray for our leaders, dear God. Continue to guide them and give them wisdom as they partner with you in leading the church, that we will unite together as a church family in fulfilling our duties as Christians while waiting for your soon return. Help us to be humble in every way. Please be with our speaker for this hour, Lord. Anoint his lips and bless the sermon that we are about to hear, and may your name be lifted up. Help us, Lord, to continue to lean on you in whatever situation we are in. And above all, help us to say, there will be done. In your name we pray. Amen.
Satisfy my needs, Lord. Satisfy my needs. Only you can make me whole. Give me strength to make me whole. Come. This sermon is the first of a two-part series on our theme of revival for this quarter. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance, against us there is no law. And when I think of a human person who could probably demonstrate this passage, I can't help but remember Mother Teresa's unselfish labors while she was still alive. For over 45 years, she ministered to the poor, the sick, the orphaned, and the dying, while guiding the missionaries of charitous expansion, first throughout in India and then in other countries. And Mother Teresa's missionaries of charity continued to expand, and at the time of her death, it was operating 610 missions in 123 countries, including hospices and homes for people with HIV and AIDS, leprosy and tuberculosis, operating for soup kitchens, children's and family counseling programs, orphanages and schools. She did it tirelessly for 45 years. Her motto was actually very simple. If you cannot feed a hundred people, then feed just one. In this life, we cannot do great things. We can only do small things with great love. Whoever, despite all the humility and the selfless service and accomplishments of Mother Teresa, her work and goodness would still look so tiny in comparison to the goodness and the mercy of our God. You see, He created us. We rebelled. We are in rebellion, but He treated us not just nice, but with tenderness and love, and He died to redeem the rebellious creatures. And yet, most of the people in the world today don't want to accept that love. If you look at it in human perspective, Earth is just 
and insignificant parts of the entire universe. He could have just wiped us out or changed us with another planet, like the way we change our belts or change our duvet cover, but he did not. He came down here and died in the hands of his subjects just because of love. And so when I read this passage of Scripture, I see God. God is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentle. He's so good. He's so faithful. He's ever meek and so temperate towards us all. However, I want us to look very closely at this verse, and we want to extract as much truth as possible, because oftentimes the gem of truth is in the fine details of the verse. First, let's look at the characteristic and quality of the fruit of the Spirit. For instance, did you notice that verse 22 uses the singular word fruit and not fruits? This is not a grammatical error. Let's look at it again. But the fruit of the Spirit is. You see, the fruit is. And then proceeded in enumerating nine different divine virtues. The question is, why is that? Well, one way of explaining it is that these divine virtues are like a cluster of grapes. Grapes is fruit, not fruits. So in a way, the fruit of the Spirit is like this bunch. One grape may taste sweeter, another may have a darker color than the other. Another may be smaller, others are bigger, but they're all grapes. Grapes is fruit, not fruits. It follows the similar pattern on the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is God, Jesus is God, the Father is God. Three persons, and yet there is one God. So love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance, nine of them is just called the fruit of the Spirit. And in addition, the nine different qualities is not for us to pick and choose. The list is not list like a buffet table to browse through. We cannot say, I'll take a little love, a portion of peace, a spoonful of self-control, but I don't want patience. Actually, it's a full meal deal. It's one kind of food with nine different qualities. And all these characteristics and virtues is in one package called the fruits of the Spirit. And these are the characteristic and quality of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, the next thing I would like us to notice is the fruits of the Spirit is developed in the life of the Christian. So these nine wonderful attributes of the true child of God are described in the word as fruit, actually refers to a developed character through the Spirit. Because you don't wake up in the morning and become instantly patient and loving. These attributes are developed gradually. Remember that the word is developed. That is how fruits are. They are developed. So a fruit is developed like this. First, you have a flower, then the pollination process, then the bud. The bud grows little by little. Then you have the fruit. The fruit is there, but we need more than just the fruit. We need a young fruit to mature. Then next to maturity, we expect the fruit to ripen. Have you tasted the sweet mango yet? Its juice is naturally sweet and it just melts in my mouth. I love to stay there. I love the mango to stay longer in my mouth. And then I swallow it so gently while briefly closing my eyes. Now, there are some people who enjoy green and ripe mango, but it is the ripe mango that is the best. It is because that is the natural way to eat fruits, to eat the ripe ones. Nobody wants to eat unripe orange or unripe table banana or pear or unripe avocado. So these attributes called the fruits of the Spirit is actually developed character in us because that's how it is with Christian character. And so these attributes called fruit is developed and that is how it is with character. Christian character is developed too. Let me explain why this is. Have you noticed that it is easy to love those who are really lovely? 
as long as everyone around is nice and pleasant, easygoing and kind, smiles all the time and agrees with you in the board meetings and members meetings, we learn little about love. These people are easy to love and they are lovable. But as soon as you pray, you say the words, Lord, help me, teach me how to love. You know, God will send someone to come into your life who is bitter, who is immoral, nasty, and mean. And when you can learn to love that person, then you will have learned something about love. So this is the meaning of this love. This is exactly how God loves me. Now, you'll be look at joy. Someone has said that joy is distinct from happiness and that happiness depends on happenings. And if these happenings don't happen to happen the way I want my happenings to happen, then I am unhappy. But joy is me being happy even when what is happening around do not happen to happen the way I want my happenings to happen. So if everything in your life is running smooth and just falling into the right place, you are happy, yes. But perhaps you are not learning anything about real joy. You don't even know if you've got any joy. Because joy is so deep and so profound. It is not affected by external things around. Because the work of the Holy Spirit is so quiet and so gentle and silent. He works from within. He goes into the inner being so that despite what happens on the outside, the inside remains calm and unmoved. The same is true with peace. Peace does not exist because of the absence of troubles, tribulations, and, and difficulties. Rather, this peace flourishes despite the lockdown, despite the economic depression or recession, and despite uncertainties ahead. In other words, this particular peace, this fruit of the Spirit, thrives independently in the individual person and is not dependent on the external influences around. This peace does not eliminate the expectation of realities of trouble, tribulation, difficulties, and challenges. It actually predicts and it allows for those because it is not disturbed or moved by any external forces. Now, what about patience? What about it? Can you have patience without trials? Patience, we know, is a byproduct of tribulation, byproduct of challenges, problems, and difficulties. And we could say the same about each of the rest. And you can work out the rest. I'm not going to discuss every single attribute until the end. The biblical point is the fruit of the Spirit is the developed character through the Spirit in our lives. And these attributes are developed gradually in the same way that any fruit-bearing tree develop their fruit. And now I decide to look this further with you in a different dimension by asking the question, what fruit is not? Well, first, fruit is not just reputation. We are not speaking of one's reputation here. Reputation is what others think you are, but character is the person you really are. Second, fruit is not just one's personality. Have you heard about someone who says, you know, he is a sanguine. Oh, you know, my daughter is choleric. That man is melancholic and she is phlegmatic. Have you heard about those? Now, someone joked about it and said, no, 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 he's not choleric, phlegmatic, sanguine, or whatever. That person is just simply diabolic. They say that every person, every one of us has a dominant trait of temperament and a secondary trait as well. Though some of us may be fascinated by personality types and the different temperaments, the Bible actually does not categorize people according to temperament or personality. The scripture doesn't describe the heart in terms of good qualities and bad qualities. The biblical classifications of people are always in terms of their relationship to God. When a person gives her heart or his heart to Jesus, something happens. They are fundamentally changed. The Christian life 
is not supposed to be a study of human personality and temperaments, but rather a process in which Christ and His character is the focus of our attention. The biblical classifications of people are always in terms of their relationship to God. The quality of our relationship to God determines the quality of our disposition, our bearing, our traits, and our character. Do we have personalities? Of course we do. Yet the urgency of the hour demands that we focus not on personality, but on character, and not on our character comparing one another amongst ourselves, but our character being compared to the character of Christ Jesus. What else that fruit is not? It's not the fruit of a person. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Many times we take the credit too much to ourselves. You see, we cannot create fruit on our own. The fruit is reproduced in our lives, in our character, yes. But the credit goes to God because this is the outworking of the Spirit in us. That's why it so plainly reads, but the fruit of the Spirit is. It's not the fruit of the person. Now, do we want to know or be reminded of the fruits of the person? Here it is. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. And of course, you know how many people are in this condition, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, including the speaker. Now, in addition to the identification that the fruit is the developed character of God in our lives, that the fruit is not the fruit of the person, but the fruits of the Spirit, that the fruit is not just personality, but character matured and ripened by difficulties and trials that God allows, I also would like to submit, in addition, that fruit by nature, is simply a reflection of the nature of the tree. Let me illustrate this. There was a story of two brothers who would, from time to time, be sent to their room if they, if they had been bad. Don't come out of the room, the father would sternly warn. But the punishment was not very effective because there was a big old tree right outside their window. And so they would go out the window, into the branches, down the tree, across the backyard, over the fence, and into the fields where they would play ball for a while. And then later, they would reverse the process, over the fence, across the backyard, up to the tree, into the branches, and onto the window, and no one would ever knew that they were gone and back. But then one day, these two boys overheard dad saying to their mom, Mary, this tree hasn't borne fruit for years. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to cut it down. They were horrified. They needed a plan, and they came up with a plan. And that evening, they went to their room early. They gathered together all of the money, went out of the window, into the branches, down the tree and into town, where they bought all of the apples they could find. And then returning home, they proceeded to tie apples onto every branch of that tree that they could reach. Then they went to bed and waited for their father to get up in the morning. Father got up and went outside. Then he came back in, calling his wife out, Mary, Mary, it's the most incredible thing I've ever seen. This tree, which hasn't borne fruit for many years, this morning is now covered with apples. You have to see this. It's absolutely covered with big, red, juicy apples. I can't believe it. The father was so amazed and impressed. Well, for a very short while. The boys thought they were clever enough. But the tree where they cleverly hang 
those apples on was not even an apple tree. It was a Bradford pear or a calorie pear tree. You see, the kind of fruit that grows on the outside is naturally and simply a reflection of the nature of the tree. You see, by nature, apples grow on apple trees. Pear trees produce pears. Mangoes produce mangoes. Lemon trees don't produce papaya. The kind of fruit that is seen on the outside is simply an outgrowth of the nature within. So you cannot build a fruit. You cannot fashion a fruit. Fruits are not made. Only plastic fruits are being manufactured. But real natural fruits are grown. You just have to grow fruits. You don't buy fruits in the market and hang them on a fruitless barren tree. You don't hang apples on a pear tree. This means that we need to stop trying hard to produce fruits. Because trying hard to be kind, trying hard to be patient, trying hard to keep the law, you try hard to live the Christian life, and finally you give up and say it's too hard. Stop the process of trying hard to produce fruit. Because trying to produce fruit that way is not what God intends for us to do. Because if you're interested in good fruit, natural fruit, the starting place is a good tree. The task is to water the tree and fertilize it, perhaps, and allow the sun and allow the rain to do their work. There is no need to try hard to produce fruits. If you have a healthy tree, the fruit will come out as a matter of course during the right season. And that's how it is as well in the Christian life. We seek to be watered and fed through His Word in as much as the tree needed the elements such as the wind, the sun, and the rain to thrive, grow, and flourish, and bear fruit. In the same manner, we need the different experiences in our lives to mature into our Christian character. You see, God allows us all to be exposed into different circumstances in the Christian life as part of our growth. We grow, we mature around good and bad people. We learn to adapt, we learn to be cautious, we learn to adjust, we learn to be tolerant, we learn to be understanding and loving. We learn what it is to love, to have joy, to have peace, to be long-suffering amidst trials and difficulties. We become gentle and we only promote what is good and we become more and more faithful to the Lord and towards each other. In a world of wastefulness and pride, we learn to offer meekness. And in all things, we are temperate. That is the fruits of the Spirit. And these attributes are rolled into one, the character of God, which has no contradiction to His law because His law, the law of God, is simply an expression of His divinity and His character. You see, in the Christian life, you don't start to work on behavior. You start to work on relationship with God. You don't start working on external habits. You start working with the heart. Let the Spirit work from within and outward. No matter how upright your life may be, no matter how many good deeds you perform, no matter how religious you may appear, you are not a genuine Christian until you know Christ personally one to one. Because doing what is right will not make you a Christian. It will only make you a moral person. The only deliberate effort in the Christian life is to seek and abide with God. A spontaneous effort towards other things will result. Therefore, first things first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If you have the right connection with Him because you intentionally seek Him in the morning, at noon, and in the evening, He will reward you with fruit. You will eventually become naturally kind, naturally loving, spontaneously giving, naturally considerate, patient, and forgiving. As the Lord feeds and waters and exposes you and me with the elements around us, He does that. However, it all has to start with the Lord. That's why Jesus says, 
I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. The focus is on abiding and connecting to the source. The bearing of the fruit then becomes natural. How natural do you seek God in the morning? Perhaps we are not that intentional in knowing God personally. We are not probably deliberate in abiding with Him. We are only deliberate in hanging apples onto a different tree. Perhaps we are deliberate in gaining facts and information, but we are not deliberate in character transformation. You see, bearing fruit is not some unique phenomenon reserved for certain types of Christians. It's the destiny of every believer. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in His people, then He will come to claim them as His own. God bless you. of Duke and family very much for presenting to us the message and we can tell it's a family affair and I'm really really grateful for that and we pray that God will continue to bless them in their ministry our continuous ministry to us and uh, therefore thank you everyone 
in the family. It's the first time I'm seeing all of them. So it's a privilege and I'm sure for most of us too, it has been the first time. So would like to welcome you officially to Bilston. And we pray that your time here will be one of happiness and joy and involvement with us. You've started that process and uh, we hope to see it developed as Pastor was saying about the fruit. So, you know, thank you very much for what you've done for us today. Mm -hmm.